Thank you very much, Professor Toti, and um, uh, it's an honor to be doing this um, presentation today uh, on behalf of uh, PCDE. Um, so Desmond is um, a structured education program that we have in the UK, developed in Leicester, where I work. Uh, and it's uh, a very interesting name. Uh, Desmond is the name of a male. Um, it stands for Diabetes Education for Self-Management of Ongoing and Newly Diagnosed Diabetes. There is a similar structured education program called Daphne, which happens to be a female name for uh, patients with type 1 uh, diabetes. So I uh, just wonder what will happen if you get a Desmond and a Daphne together in a relationship. That would make for a good um, educational uh, package for patients with diabetes. Anyway, back to the topic for today. We are supposed to be talking about structured education programs and the outline of my um, session will be uh, talking about um, the definition of uh, structured education programs. And I will also go into the Desmond example that we have developed in Leicester and then spend a bit of time on the challenges and possibly some opportunities that we can uh, take from our experience. So by way of introduction, uh, the chronic care model, which we know of, uh, has proved to be one of the most comprehensive model of um, healthcare uh, provision across the world around chronic diseases. And within that, you have the healthcare systems um, you know, delivering uh, self-management, uh, self-delivery uh, systems design, uh, decision uh, support, and clinical information. Um, if you look closely in that model, you realize that self-management and uh, informed, um, you know, activated patients are crucial uh, within that health system model. And when you go to the definition of um, the, the, the structured education program. Um, I mean, we're honored to be in the presence of Professor Hassal here today. Um, you, you realize that the, the importance is to emphasize the quality of the diabetes care uh, in general. And this doesn't usually result in good outputs. And the reasons why we don't get good outputs for patients with uh, diabetes uh, usually uh, always go back to the fact that patients do not get proper education about their chronic condition. We don't address their beliefs um, and because we don't address their beliefs we don't uh, attain the metabolic control that we need. Uh, there is no facilitation of behavioral change uh, in these patients and as a result you know uh, everything including their mental health um, um, also uh, deteriorate. So if we're able to get a diabetes education very early in the disease trajectory, um, we stand a chance of achieving uh, good uh, outcomes later on. So there are four principles in uh, patient-centered care. First of all, uh, it's got to be personalized, okay? So the idea that uh, we can prescribe you know, an intervention uh, and offload it onto a patient and expect good outcomes. When it comes to chronic diseases, usually doesn't tend to work. It's got to be personalized to the patient's needs. And once you've identified those personal needs for the patients, you then go forward in enabling the patient to be able to do something about their personalized decisions. So what we can do as, as healthcare providers is to then facilitate the coordination of what we have to provide from different sources uh, around the patient. And so we do that recognizing that uh, we need a bit of comp compassion and respect and treat the patients with dignity. And that tends to, um, to work. A lot of studies have been conducted in structured education and a lot of the times we have seen a lot of very good uh, outcomes. When it comes to metabolic uh, changes, A1 reduction, 11 studies in a systematic review have uh, been pulled together and the aggregate data have shown uh, good outcomes, a very significant p-value there. Um, 
And it's not just A1C for your fasting, um, plasma glucose control, diabetes knowledge, uh, self-management skills, and uh, self-efficacy and empowerment, and weight reductions, all of them have proven to be statistically significant when it comes to uh, uh, structured education for patients with type 2 diabetes. So, um, in terms of um, a structured, a definition of a structured education program, there are some key terms that needs to be included in that definition. Firstly, I need to emphasize that it's got to be evidence-based. Okay, uh, we have stated that there are some benefits, but there is no point doing a structured education program just because you've heard that these programs work. It's got to be evidence-based. What is the evidence that a structured education program you've developed works? Because there are different types. And it's got to be flexible to the needs of the individual patient. The program needs to have specific aims and objectives for the patients. They need to know what they are getting into and what they are going to get out of it. Okay, and um, the, the program should support self-management. Okay, their attitudes, beliefs, and knowledge should be um, uh, uh, tackled during the educational program. Six components uh, in designing this. Firstly, we've talked about the patient-centered philosophy, so there's got to be a theoretical basis for that. And you should have a written, structured written curriculum for uh, a structured education program. I've already talked about the evidence base. This should be peer-reviewed, published for everybody to know how it works. Then, of course, you need your trained educators, and they could be lay educators. Previous speakers have already talked about how you don't necessarily need healthcare professionals. You can use, you know, lay educators to do uh, the teaching of their peers. There has to be a quality assurance of the program. You know, what's the, you know, the, 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 the proof that what you're doing is what was proven in the evidence that was generated in the first instance. And of course, you need to audit what you're doing. Uh, there's no point doing it and not looking back to see what you've done in the past has actually worked. It needs to be audited every now and then. So, uh, Desmond program, I've already defined Desmond program. So, if you take a structured education program, I would like to sort of um, relate it to what we do in drug development. And the reason I, 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 I make that you know, huge leap is because we've got a very structured program when it comes to drug development. You go through your preclinical pre phase where you work with mice and rats in the laboratory, and then you come to your phase one trials, phase two trials, and your phase three trials, and then ongoing um, evaluations of real life data. So in structured education programs, if we are arguing that there are all these benefits which you've heard about, and if we are saying that there should be evidence, okay, then of course there should be a sort of structure akin to what we see in the development of a drug. Because if you look at drug development until recently where we've got some class of drugs that are, you know, that have extra glycemic benefits, a lot of the drugs that we've had over the years will normally just control your A1C. Uh, but recently we're getting some drugs that have further extra glycemic benefits. When it comes to structured education programs, invariably, in addition to your metabolic control, you always have a lot of other extra glycemic uh, benefits. And so when you then line it with drug trials, you find that the preclinical phase could be called our theoretical phase, where we explore uh, the theoretical uh, evidence surrounding what we want to do and you know, critically evaluate the confounding factors around these theories. Then you go your phase one, or what we call the modeling phase, where you identify various components of the intervention. This is a complex intervention, so you evaluate the various um, interventions and see how they interact with each other uh, uh, to predict the, the outcome that we want. Once you've done that, you want to look at the exploratory trial, where you describe a, a variable which happens to be constant throughout all the other interventions and how that affects your, 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 your final outcome. And then of course you want to look at your phase three trial, which will be a randomized control trial of your intervention, comparing to maybe routine practice and to see what the outcomes would be. And of course once you've done that, your phase four equivalent will be how 
your uh, structured education program that's developed can be replicated in other health settings. So this is the way we want to look at it in the development of a properly designed uh, structured education program. So, um, you know, the educational intervention, if we look at, if we then compare that to um, drug development, which I've already mentioned, at the moment we've got a lot of, you know, rules and regulations when it comes to um, drugs. So if both interventions, a drug trial or a structured education program, are supposed to reduce your hemoglobin A1C, think about these questions. Which one, which of these interventions has usually, in most settings, a poor evidence base with poorly designed trials? Will it be your drug trial or your structured education programs? You couldn't get a drug in the market without FDA approval or EMA approval. That would not happen anywhere in the world. Which of these interventions is delivered by untrained staff with no quality assurance? Imagine getting an SGLT2 out in the market and getting people who are not doctors, let alone diabetologists, to be prescribing it. You know, most centers, prescribing of new agents are restricted to specialists. Uh, and if GPs are allowed to prescribe it, they should have undertaken a certain level of skill. Which of those two interventions, you know, will have a variable, you know, content or uncertain ingredients? Even if the drug has come off patent, and any company can just manufacture the drug and start selling it. You still need a lot of, you know, you still need some, some, some measures to ensure that the ingredients in that metformin that has gone generic are the same ingredients that were uh, supposed to be in the original trials. Would you just omit the intervention because of lack of resources? Will you take half the dose just because you want to save money? We certainly will not do that for drug trials. And if we are saying that structured education, patient education, structured patient education has got a lot of these benefits, like drugs and more, why would you not want to consider them in the same measure? So, the next one example. So what we do in Leicester, UK is, you know, um, we identify the patient as ultimately being responsible for their self-management. That's a theoretical base. These patients will know the barriers for their self-management. So you're focused on the patient, okay? You, they know their barriers, okay? And they will know how to maximize. They will know that maximizing quality of life is their prime objective. They will tell you that themselves. And so as a result of that, the consequences of their diabetes as experienced by themselves is what will be central to the structured education program. It's based on a lot of um, theoretical, there's a lot of theoretical basis. You've got a common sense model, the dual processing theory, and social learning theory. So that's where you start the development of a stretch education program. When our patients gather in groups to undergo their stretch education program, we normally start with the patient's story. If you can see that, I don't know if this pointer works, but somewhere there, uh, the patient's story. That's where we start from, and allow the patient to tell you their story. You know, uh, there is a facilitator who is there to facilitate the discussion in the group. The patient tells you their story. What is diabetes? What is diabetes? What is their understanding of diabetes? Okay, uh, then they discuss it. Each person in the group will tell you what the understanding will be, of course, and you facilitate. Then they will tell the main ways to manage their diabetes. All of them broken down in lay terms for them to understand the consequences of their diabetes. Monitoring, taking action, food choices. We've seen you know, a very lovely uh, food diagram in the previous um, um, presentation. So we have all those real you know, models of food on the table for them to go through. And they'll look at which, what is glucose and fats and insulin resistance. They'll discuss all that in their lay terms. And of course, they'll discuss physical activity, stress and emotion, screening clinics, and then planning, care planning for their diabetes. 
So uh, based on this, we had our uh, maiden publication, the Desmond, uh, in almost 10 years now, in 2008, the BMJ. And so there is evidence uh, on that, uh, on the Desmond program. Um, and we've gone through the phases that I described earlier on the development of the program. The results of the, uh, the, the Desmond trial, in summary, we showed um, a trend towards a decrease in A1C, uh, not quite achieving statistical significance. However, you did get uh, positive results in terms of weight loss, smoking cessation rates, uh, changes in health beliefs, reducing depression scores, and improvement in uh, uh, CVD risk scores. You know, which is important. I mean. We are entering an era where we look at diabetes not in terms of just uh, reductions in A1C, but everything else. Uh, it's a public health condition, and uh, in, more, in a lot of healthcare uh, uh, centers now, or healthcare providers now, just managing to control a patient's diabetes uh, and forgetting about their other chronic diseases is not enough. We move into an era where multimorbidity is becoming more crucial because we cannot afford to you know, focus on this one disease element alone. And so if you have you know, a, a, an intervention that provides the benefits of improving CVD risk, you know, in addition to all the things that I've mentioned, actually, it's a good thing. Um, so if you look at the Desmond program, it sort of ticks a lot of boxes there. We have a written curriculum. There is you know, a theoretical philosophy underpinning the design of the program. It's a formal training program for the educators and they are quality assured. There is an audit and evaluation process built in the program and we've got robust publications uh, in the Desmond, um, made in Desmond uh, program and it's uh, family uh, programs. And I say family programs because uh, over the past 10 years we have developed various other uh, programs on top of the made in publication. We now have um, programs around uh, patients at risk of developing diabetes, uh, programs developed to target patients of you know, minority ethnic groups. We've got ongoing programs, not just for newly diagnosed, um, programs you know, targeting patients with multimorbidity are ongoing now. So there's a lot of you know, other babies of Desmond and grandchildren of Desmond springing up in Leicester. So um, at the moment, we can boast of having trained a fifth of a million uh, uh, Desmond graduates. Um, there's a lot of um, interest in Desmond, very widely used across the UK, and we've gone international to Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, Gibraltar, and recently South Saharan Africa and the Middle East. We've got uh, spread of Desmond to Malawi and Mozambique and in the Middle East to Qatar. Locally in Leicester, recent evaluation has shown that even in the A1C that I, I didn't show statistical significance in the initial publication, uh, locally, looking at uh, over 1,600 patients, we have been able to demonstrate a reduction in A1C of almost one percentage point uh, within six months. Um, and, and that was remarkable uh, with the Desmond program. How about cost? How does it rank if you compare that to other interventions that you have thus far? Well, the cheapest we have so far is metformin, regular metformin. Then you have your SUs, not without its side effects of hypoglycemia. If you look at the cost per collie, collie is quality adjusted life years. Uh, Desmond uh, is somewhere, you know, competing very favorably with the rest of them. Um, you wouldn't, you know, uh, say much, you know, against it if you look at the fact that it's actually coming up, you know, around number three after metformin and SU. Uh, the quality for Desmond will be around um, 2,000 pounds a year which if you compare to DPP4 inhibitors by 4,000, almost 4,700, uh, close to 5,000 pounds, I think it's good value for money. What are the challenges? Well, um, there are some successes. If you compare to type 1 diabetics, um, the 
uptake in type 2 diabetes um, structured education program seems to be improving in the UK uh, with about 78% of um, patients recording having been offered a structured education program compared to 32%. And this has gradually increased over the past, you know, seven, eight years. Uh, from 2009 to 2015. So the message is, you know, getting home. You know, clinicians are offering it at the very least. The uptake is not as uh, impressive, but at least we are offering it. We are appreciating the importance of structured education programs. There are a lot of them that are springing up. Uh, we've got this one, we've got Spotlight, Tonic, Juggle, Diabetes and You. There's so many uh, different structured education programs in the East Midlands, where well, that's located in the UK. NIAS has got some quality standards. Um, you know, it appears that only Desmond seems to be ticking the boxes that are recommended by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK. But the rest are out there. So some of the challenges we have in um, structure education programs are the lack of clear definition. Um, you know, so we agree on what a structured education program is, but we're trying to impress it on providers that it's got to meet all those standards that are mentioned. The abs absence of robust, you know, quality assurance nationally or even internationally. There's no reason why we should have an FDA and EMA, and there shouldn't be, you know, a robust quality uh, assurance body uh, in the various countries to to you know, quality assure what people provide for patients. Uh, it is extremely important. We know it is good, but that just means that in this capitalist environment, you're just creating an atmosphere where private providers could actually capitalize on this and provide something that is supposed to be good, but not exactly what was initially designed by various evidence-based uh, structured education programs. Even the ones that have got good evidence base, we are not embedding them in, the, you know, in clinical pathways. Why is it that we have guidelines everywhere? We've got a, you know, nice guidelines which mentions it, but in the pathway you, you don't find it. You don't find such education running through the pathway. ADA, EAZ consensus statement, and you know, uh, whatever you call it these days, you've got clear, you know, uh, steps as to what to add after metformin. Um, if there is so much evidence for structured education, why don't we probably include you know, structured education programs probably at every step, in addition to, not in place of, in addition to your pharmacological therapy at all the steps. Um, we haven't got that embedded, so the message is not getting home. Then there's some confusion about the creation of the three-step approach. And by the three-step approach, I mean these steps. Level one, where the doctor will mention structured education program at diagnosis or at any time of an encounter with their patient. But is that actually a structured education program? No, not necessarily. Then the step two, the patient learns something from their peers. Then of course there's a step three, where they attend a structured education program with clear curriculum and you know, teaching and philosophy underpinning what they're learning with good quality assurance on audit programs. And that's how we're talking. So these definitions uh, have actually caused a bit of confusion as well. Then of course, where is the place of technology? That's something that's not been mentioned yet. In this day and age, technology should play a crucial role in structured education programs. So, if we talk about validation, um, what we would want to see is a situation where um, the programs have been developed and embedded and translated at local levels with you know, validating bodies, ensuring that providers of structured education programs are on a sort of register. And to get on that register, you tick the boxes of what is supposed to be a structured education. Otherwise, um, people can seize the opportunity to rip off these vulnerable patients and provide something that may not necessarily provide the outcomes that the patient deserve, as was established in various trials for structured education programs. And if you add um, e-health or um, 
telehealth to stretch education. I'm not sure what the evidence of this is. There are various, you know, uh, uh, mixed messages coming from this. Uh, it's all very new, this area. But there is a potential to add e-health into um, the chronic care model and improve the outcomes for patients. So to conclude, um, we, you know, lack clear understanding and uh, uh, I would say that valuing the evidence for stretch education and applying the evidence is actually very crucial in this era of Trump, um, where we take evidence for granted. Um, we need robust national and international guidelines to uh, oversee what comes in the market, and we have to ensure that we embed whatever uh, we have found into routine clinical practice for patients, and digital health has a place uh, in patient education. Um, I just conclude by sharing this uh, meeting. I mean, it's a structured education uh, meeting later in the year in Galway. Uh, those of you who are interested, you can you know um, attend somewhere later this year where you get more information on this uh, program. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions.